Hello and welcome back to Wicked the Fool Story. We are finishing up with the death of the witch. So here we go. We're starting with the last paragraph on page 7,671. Here we go. Under cover of darkness, the witch slipped away on her broom and saw to it that the suffering soldier died at once. She thought one afternoon, inexplicably, of the baby lion cub taken from its mother and pressed in a service in Dr. Nindick's lab back in shit. She remembered how it had cowered. She remembered the fuss she had made about it, or was she only glorifying herself in hindsight? If it was the same lion, grown up timid and unnatural, it should have no bone to pick with her. She had saved it when it was young, hadn't she? They confused her, this band of yellow brick road irregulars. The tin woodman was hollow, a tic-tac cipher, or an eviscerated human under a spell. The lion was a perversion of its own natural instincts. She could deal with tic-tac clockworks. She could handle animals. But it was a scarecrow she feared. Was it a spell? Was it a mask? Was there merely some clever dancer inside? All three of them were emasculated in some way or other, deluded under the spell of the girl's innocence. She could give the lion a history and think of him as that abused cub in Shiz, Science Hall. She suspected that Nick Chopper was the victim of her own sister spite and magic, casualty of the enchanted axe. But she had no way to place the scarecrow. She began to think that behind that painted cornmeal sack, a face, there was a face she would know, a face she'd been waiting for. She lit a candle and said the words aloud as if she could really do spells. The words blew aside the taper of grayish smoke that rose from the fatty tallow. If they had any other effect in the world, then that she didn't know it yet. Piero didn't die, she said. He was imprisoned and he has escaped. He is coming home to Kiyamoko. He is coming home to me. He is disguised as a scarecrow because he doesn't yet know what he will find. It would take brains to think up such a plan. She took an old tunic of Fierro's. She called elder, elderly Killjoy and bade him sniff it well and sent him down the valley. Every day, so if the travelers showed up, Killjoy would be able to find them and lead them home rejoicing. And though she tried not to sleep, on occasion she could not help it. Her dream brought Fierro closer and closer to home. Chapter 15 There was a day in the first gust of autumn that the banners and standards of the camp below were shifted and bulges grew tinnily up the slope to the castle. By this, the witch guessed that the troop had arrived in Red Windmill and were being given a royal welcome. They've come so far. They won't wait now, she said. Go, Killjoy. Go find them and show them the quickest way here. She loosed the senior dog, and so strong were his exhortations that the entire pack of his kin went racing along with him, howling with joy, frantic to do their duty. Nanny, cried the witch, put on a clean petticoat and change your apron. We'll have company by nightfall. But the dog didn't come back. All afternoon and into the gloaming, and the witch could see why. With a telescopic eye in its cylindrical casing, invented by the witch along the lines of Dr. Dilliman's discovery about opposing lenses, she followed a shock of carnage. Dorothy and the lion trembled with the scarecrow beyond while the tin woodman struck the heads of her beast one after the other with his axe. Killjoy and his wolfy relations lay scattered like dead soldiers on a field of retreat. The witch danced with rage and summoned Lear. Your dog is dead. Look what they did, she cried. Look and make sure that I didn't only imagine it. Well, I didn't like that dog very much anymore, said Lear. He had a good long life, anyway. He concurred, trembling, but then trained the glass on the slope again. You fool! That Dorothy is not for messing with, she cried, slapping the instrument out of his hand. You're awfully on edge for someone about to have company, he said sullenly. They are supposed to be coming to kill me, if you remember, she said, although she had forgotten that as she had forgotten her desire for the shoes until she saw them again in the glass. The wizard had not demanded them of Dorothy. Why not? What fresh campaign of intrigue was this? She wheeled about her room, whipping pages of the grimery back and forth. She recited a spell, did it wrong, did it again, and then turned and tried to apply it to the crows. Though the original three crows had long since fallen stiffly from the top of the doorframe, there were plenty of others in residence still, rather inbred and silly, but suggestible in a stupid, mob-like way. Go, she said. Look with your eyes more closely than I can. Pull the mask off the scarecrow so we know who he is. Get them for me. Peck out the eyes of Dorothy and the lion, and three of you go on ahead to the old Princess Nestoria out there in the thousand-year grasslands, for the time is coming when we will be reunited, all of us, with the help of the Grimmery, the wizard may topple at last. 
I never know what you're talking about anymore, said Lear. You can't blind them. Oh, watch me, snarled the witch. The crows blew away in a black cloud and dropped like buckshot through the sky, down the jagged precipice, until they came to the travelers. A pretty sunset is there, said Nanny, coming up to the witch's room in one of her rare forays. Chistery, as always, providing service. She sent the crows out to blind the guests coming for dinner. What? She's blinding the guests coming for dinner. Well, that's one way to avoid having to dust, I suppose. Well, you lunatics, hush up. The witch was twitching as if with a nervous disorder. Her elbows flapped as if she were a crow herself. She gave it a long howl when she found them in the glass. What? What? Let me see, said Clear, grabbing the thing. He explained to Nanny, because the witch was almost beyond speech by now. Well, I guess the scarecrow knows how to scare crows, all right. Why? What's he done? I'm not coming back. That's all I'll say, said Lear, glancing at the witch. It could still be him, she said at last, breathing heavily. You might get your wish yet, Lear. My wish? He didn't remember asking for a father, and she didn't bother to remind him. Nothing had yet suggested to her that the scarecrow wasn't a man in disguise. She would not need forgiveness if Fiero had not died. The light was failing, and the odd band of friends was making good time up the hill. They had come without an escort of soldiers, perhaps because the soldiers really believed that Kiamako was run by a wicked witch. Come on, bees, said the witch. Work with me now. All together on this one, honeys. We need a little sting. We need a little zip. We need a little nasty. Can you give us a little jab? No, no, not us. Listen when I talk to you, simpletons. The girl on the hill below, she's after your queen bee. And when you're through with your job, I'll go down and collect those shoes. What's that old hag blathering about now? said Nanny to Lear. The bees were alert to the pitch in the witch's voice, and they rose to swarm out the window. You watch. I can't look, said the witch. The moon is just like a pretty peach rising over the mountain, said Nanny with the telescope to her old cataract eye. Why don't we put in some peach trees instead of all those infernal apples on the back? The bees, Nanny. Lear, take that from her and tell me what happens. Lear gave a blow-by-blow blow recounting. They're swooping down. They look like a genie or something, all flying in a big clump with a straggly tail. The travelers see them coming. Yes, yes, the scarecrow is taking straw of his chest and leggings and covering the lion and Dorothy. The little dog, too. Bees can't get through the straw, and the scarecrow is all in pieces on the ground. It couldn't be. The witch grabbed the eyepiece. Lear, you're a filthy liar, she shouted. Her heart roared like a wind. But it was true. There was nothing but straw and air inside the scarecrow's clothes. No hidden lover returning, no last hope of salvation. And the bees, having none left to attack but the tin woodman, flung themselves against him and dropped him black heaps on the ground like charred shatters. Their stingers blunted on his fenders. You got to give our guests credit for ingenuity, said Lear. Well, you shut up before I tie your tongue in a knot, said the witch. I suppose I should start down and get some hors d'oeuvres going. They'll be peckish after these ordeals you're setting them, said Nanny. Have you an opinion as to cheese and crackers or fresh vegetables with pepper sauce? I say cheese, says Lear. Alphaba, what's your opinion? But she was too busy doing research in the grimmery. It's up to me, as always was the case, said Nanny. I get to do all the work. I'm supposed to be teary with joy at my age. You think I could rest my feet for once, but no. Always the bridesmaid, never the bride. Always the godfather, never the god, said Lear. Will you two please have mercy on me? Now go on, Nanny, if you're going. Nanny headed out the door as fast as her old limbs could take her. The witch said, Chistery, let her go on her own. Deem, I need you here. Sure, let me tumble to my death, delighted to be of service, said Nanny. It's going to be cheese for that. The witch explained to Chester what she wanted. This is foolish. It'll be dark before long, and they'll tumble over some cliff and die. The poor dears, I'd rather not. I mean, the Tim Woodman and the Scarecrow, they can tumble all they want, and not be much hurt, I imagine. A good tidsmith could repair a battered torso, but bring me Dorothy and the lion. Dorothy has my shoes, and I have a rendezvous with the lion. We're old friends. Can you do this? Chittery squinted, nodded, and shook his head. Shrugged, spat. Well, try. What good are you if you don't try, she said. Off with you and your cronies with you. Turned to Lear. 
Okay, there, are you satisfied? I haven't asked them to be killed. They're going to be escorted here as our guest. I'll get the shoes and let them go on their way. And then I'll walk this grimmery into the mountains and live in a cave. If you're old enough to take care of yourself, good riddance to bad rubbish. Who needs forgiveness now? Well, they're coming to kill you, he said. Yes, and aren't you just breathless with anticipation for that? I'll protect you, he said uneasily. And then added, but not to the extent of harming Dorothy. Oh, go set the table and tell Nanny to forget the cheese and crackers and go with the vegetables. She shook a broom at him. Go, I tell you, when I tell you to go. When she was alone, she sank in a heap. Either phenomenal luck lay with these travelers, or they had enough courage, brains, and heart among them to do quite well. She was taking the wrong approach. Clearly, she would welcome the child, explain the situation nicely, and get the shoes while she could. With the shoes, with the help of the Princess Nestoria, maybe there would be vengeance against the wizard yet. Anyway, the grimmery would be hidden, one way or the other, and the shoes were moved outside of the wizard's reach. But the shock of the death of her familiars made her blood run cold inside her. She could feel her thoughts and intentions tumbling over and over one another. And she really wasn't sure what she would do when she was face to face with Dorothy. Chapter 16 Larry and Nanny stood on the either side of the doorway, smiling when Chistery and his companions came down with an ill-judged whoop, dumping their passengers onto the cobbles of the inner courtyard. The lion moaned in pain and wept from vertigo. Dorothy sat up, clutching the small dog in her arms, and said, And where might we be now? Welcome, said Nanny, genuflecting. Hello, said Lear, and twisting one foot around the other and falling over into a bucket of water. You must be tired after your long trip, said Nanny. Would you like to freshen up here? Some before we have a little light meal? Nothing fancy, you know. We're way off the beaten track. This is Kiamako, said Lear, beat red and standing up again. The stronghold of the Ajiri tribe. This is still winky territory, said the girl anxiously. What'd she say? The little poppin'? Tell her to speak up, said Nanny. It's called the Vinka, said Lear. Winky is kind of an insult. Oh, goodness, I wouldn't want to offend anyone, she said. Mercy, no. Aren't you a pretty little girl? All your arms and legs in the right place and such delicate, sensible, inoffensive skin, said Nanny, smiling. I'm Leary, said, and I live here. This is my castle. I'm Dorothy, she said, and I'm very worried about my friend, the Tim Woodman and the Scarecrow. Oh, please, can't somebody do something for them? It's dark and they'll be lost. They can't be hurt. I'll go get them tomorrow in the daylight, said Lear. Promise, I do anything, really, anything. You're so sweet, just like everyone else here, said Dorothy. Oh, Lion, are you all right? Was it terrible? If the unnamed god had wanted lions to fly, he'd have given them hot air balloons, said the lion. I'm afraid I lost my lunch somewhere over the ravine. Warm welcome, Nanny chirped. We've been expecting you. I've worn my finger to the bone, making a little something. It's not much, but everything we have is yours. That's our motto here in the mountain. The traveler is always welcome. Let's go find some hot water and soap at the pump, shall we, and then go in. You're too kind, but I need to find the Wicked Witch of the West, Dorothy said. I said the Wicked Witch of the West. I'm so sorry to trouble you. And it looks like a perfectly wonderful castle. Perhaps on the way back, if my travels take me this way... Oh, well, she lives here too, said Lear. With me. Don't worry, she's here. Dorothy looked a little pale. She is? The witch appeared at the doorway. She is indeed, and here she is, she said. Came down the steps at a clip, her skirts whirling, her broom hurrying to keep up. Well, Chisterly, you did good work. I'm glad to see all my efforts haven't been for naught. You, Dorothy? Dorothy Gale? The one whose house had the nerve to make a crash landing on my sister. Well, it wasn't my house in a legal sense, strictly speaking, said Dorothy. And in fact, it hardly belonged much to Annie M and Uncle Henry, except for maybe a couple of windows in the chimney. I mean, the mechanics and farmers first state bank of Wichita holds the mortgage, so they're responsible parties. I mean, if you need to be in touch with someone, they're the bank that cares, she explained. The witch felt suddenly, oddly calm. Nothing to me who owns the house, she said. The fact is, my sister was alive before you arrived. Now she's dead. Oh, and I'm so very sorry about that, said Dorothy nervously. Really, I am. I'd have done anything to avoid it. I know how terrible I'd feel if a house fell on Auntie M. 
Once a board in the porch roof fell on her. She had a big lump bump on her head and sang hymns all afternoon. But by evening, she was all cranky self. Dorothy tucked a little dog under her arm, went up, and took the witch's hands in hers. Really, I'm sorry, she insisted. It's a terrible thing to lose someone. I lost my parents when I was small, and I remember. Get off me, said the witch. I hate false sentiment. It makes my skin crawl. But the girl held on with a ragged sort of intensity and said nothing, just waited. Let go, let go, said the witch. Were you close to your sister, asked Dorothy. That's not the point, she snapped. Because I was very close to my mama, and when she and Papa were lost at sea, I could barely bear it. Lost at sea? How do you mean? said the witch, detaching herself from the clean child. They were on the way to visit my grandmama in the old country, because she was dying, and a storm came up, and their ship went over and broke in half, and sank to the bottom of the sea. And they drowned. Every soul on board. Oh, so they had souls, said the witch, her mind recoiling at the image of a ship in all that water. They'll do. It's all they have left, I suspect. Please, will you not cling so? And come in for something to eat. Come on, you two, said the girl to the lion. And it stalkily rolled onto its big padded paws and followed along. So now we turn into a restaurant, thought the witch darkly. What shall I send a flying monkey down to Red Windmill to engage a violinist for mood music? What a most peculiar murderer she is turning out to be. The witch began to think about how she might disarm the girl. It was hard to tell what her weapons were, except for that sort of inane good sense and emotional honesty. During dinner, Dorothy began to cry. What, she would have preferred the vegetables or the cheese, said Nanny? The girl could not answer. She set her both hands on the scrubbed oaken tabletop and her shoulders shook with grief. Lear longed to get up and wrap his arms around her. The witch nodded grimly that he was to stay put. He whacked his milk mug hard on the table in annoyance. It's all very nice, Dorothy said at last, sniffling, but I'm so worried for Uncle Henry and Auntie Em. Uncle Henry frets so when it, I'm just a wee bit late from the schoolhouse, and Auntie Em, well, she can be so cross when she's upset. All Annie's are cross, said Lear. Eat up, but who knows when another meal will come your way, said the witch. The girl tried to eat, but kept dissolving in tears. Eventually, Lear began to tear up, too. The little dog, Toto, begged for scraps, which made the witch think of her own losses. Killjoy, who had been with her eight years, a fly-ridden corpse going stiff on the hill among all his progeny. She cared less about the bees and the crows, but Killjoy was her special pet. Well, this is some party, said Nanny. I wonder if I should have pretty things up with a candle. Kindle, candle, kindle said Chistering. Nanny lit a candle and sang happy birthday to you to make Dorothy feel better, but no one joined in. Then silence fell. Only Nanny kept eating, finishing the cheese and starting on the candle. Lear was turning white and pink by turns, and Dorothy had began to stare blankly at a knothole in the polished wood of the trestle table. The witch scratched her finger with her knife and the, ran the blade along her forefinger softly, as if it were the feather of a phoenix. What's going to happen to me, said Dorothy, lapsing into a monitor. I shouldn't have come here. Nanny, Lear, said the witch, take yourselves off to the kitchen. Bring the lion with you. Is that old bag talking to me? Nanny asked Lear. Why is the little girl crying? Our food not good enough for her? I'm not leaving Dorothy's side, said the lion. Don't I know you, said the witch in a low, even voice. You were the cub they did experiments with in the science lab at Shiz long ago. You were terrified then, and I spoke up for you. I'll save you again if you behave. I don't want to be saved, said the lion petulantly. I know the feelings of the witch, but you can teach me something about animals in the wild, whether they revert or how much. I take it you were raised in the wild. You can be of service. You can protect me when I'm... Go out of here with my grimery, my book of magics, my malus, malafericum, my mesmerizing incatabulum, my codex of scarabee, plot and gamadian, my text samaturological. The lion roared so suddenly they were all jolted in their seats. Even Dorothy. Thunder at night, devil delight, observed Nanny, glancing out the window. I better take in the laundry. I'm bigger than you, said the lion to the witch, and I'm not letting Dorothy alone with you. The witch swooped down and gathered the little dog in her arms. Chissery, go dump this thing in the fish well, she said. Chissery looked dubious, but scampered away with Toto under his arms like a yapping furry loaf of bread. 
Oh no, save him, someone, said Dorothy. The witch shot out her hand and pinned her to the table. But the lion had catapulted into the kitchen after the snow monkey and Toto. Lear, lock the kitchen door, shouted the witch. Bar it so they can't come back. No, no, cried Dorothy. I'll go with you, just don't hurt Toto. He's done nothing to you. She turned to Lear and said, Please don't let that monkey hurt my Toto. The lion is useless. Don't trust him to save my little dog. Do I take it we'll be having pudding by the fire, said Nanny, looking up brightly. It's caramel custard. The witch took Dorothy's hand and began to lead her away. Lear suddenly leaped over and took a hold of Dorothy's other hand. Yo, hag, let her alone, he shouted. Lear, really, you picked the most awkward times to develop character, said the witch wearily, quietly. Don't embarrass yourself and me with this charade of courage. I'll be all right. Just take care of Toto, said Dorothy. Oh, Lear, take care of Toto, no matter what. Please, he needs a home. Lear leaned over and kissed Dorothy, who fell against the wall in astonishment. Release me, mumbled the witch. Whatever my faults, I don't deserve this. Chapter 17. She pushed Dorothy ahead of her into the tower room and locked the door behind her. The long period of sleeplessness was making her head spin. What have you come for, she said to the girl. I know why you have tramped all the way from the Emerald City. But go on, tell me to my face. Have you come to murder me, as the rumors say? Or do you carry a message from the wizard, maybe? Is he now willing to bargain the book for Nora? The magic for the child? Tell me, or I know. He's instructed you to steal my book. Is it that? But the girl only backed away, looking left and right for an escape. There was no way out except the window, and that was a deadly fall. Tell me, said the witch. I'm all alone in a strange land. Don't make me do this, said the girl. It came to kill me and then to steal the grimmery. I don't know what you're talking about. First, give me the shoes, said the witch, for they're mine, and we'll talk. I can't. They won't come off, said the girl. I think Glinda put a spell on them. I've been trying to get them off for days. My socks are so sweaty. It's not to be believed. Give them me, snarled the witch. If you go back to the wizard with them, you'll be playing right into his hands. No, look, they're stuck shouted the girl. She kicked at one heel with the other toe. Look, see, I'm trying. I'm trying. They won't come off. Honest promise? I tried to give them to the wizard when he demanded them, but they wouldn't come off. There's something the matter with them. They're too tight or something. Or maybe I'm growing. You have no right to those shoes, said the witch. She circled. The girl backed away, stumbling over furniture, knocking over the beehive, and stepping on the queen bee who had emerged from the fragments. Everything I have, every little thing I have, dies when you come across it, said the witch. There's Lear down below, ready to throw me over for the sake of a single kiss. My beasts are dead, my sister is dead, you strewed death in your path, you're just a girl. You remind me of Nor. She thought the world was magic, and look what happened to her. What? What happened? said Dorothy, pitifully playing for time. She found out just how magic it was. She was kidnapped and lives her miserable life as a political prisoner. But so you have kidnapped me, and I asked for none of it. Nothing. You must have mercy. The witch came near and grabbed the girl by the wrist. Why do you want to murder me, she said. Can you really believe the wizard will do as he says? He doesn't know what truth means, so he does not even know how he lies. And I did not kidnap you, you fool. You came here of your own accord to murder me. I didn't come to murder anyone, said the girl, shrinking back. Are you the adept, said the witch suddenly. Aha, are you the third adept? Is that it? Nessa Rose, Glinda, and you? Did Madame Morrible constrict you for service to the hidden power? You work in collusion, my sister's shoes, my friend's charm, and your innocent strength. Admit it, admit it, you're the adept, admit it! I'm not adept, I'm adopted, said the girl. I'm sure not adept at anything, can you tell that? You're my soul come scavenging for me, I can feel it, said the witch. I won't have it, I won't have it, I won't have a soul. With a soul there is everlastingness, and life has tortured me enough. The witch pulled Dorothy back to the corridor and stuck the end of her broom in a torch fire. Nanny was hobbling up the stairs, leaning on Chistery, who had some dishes of pudding on a tray. I locked the whole lot of them in the kitchen until they stopped their roughhousing, Nanny was muttering. Such a hubbub, such a racket, such a wild rumpus. Nanny won't have it. Nanny's too old. They're all beasts. Back in the dusty recesses of Kiyama Co, the dog barked once or twice. The lion roared and pounded against the kitchen door, and Lear shrieked. Dorothy, we're coming! 
But the witch turned and shot out her foot and toppled Nanny over. The old woman rolled and slid, ooing and wooing, down the stairs. Chistery chasing after her in consternation. The kitchen door had burst its hinges, and the lion and Lear came tumbling out, falling over the big heap of Nanny at the foot of the stairs. Up, you up, shouted the witch. I'll have done with you before you have done with me. Dorothy had wrenched herself free and dashed up the corkscrew stairs of the tower ahead of the witch. There was only one exit, and that was to be the parapet. The witch followed in good speed, needing to finish the deed before the lion and Lear arrived. She would get the shoes, she would take the grimmery, she would abandon Lear and Nora and disappear into the wilderness. She would burn the book and the shoes, and then she would bury herself. Dorothy was a dark shape, huddled over, retching on the stones. You haven't answered my question, said the witch, poking the torch up high, releasing specters and ghosts among the shadows of the castellation. You've come hunting me down, and I want to know, why will you murder me? The witch slammed the door behind her and locked it. All the better. The girl could only gasp. You think they're not telling stories about you all over Oz? You think I don't know the wizard sent you here to bring back proof that I was dead? Oh, that, said Dorothy. That is true, but that's not why I came. They can't possibly be a competent liar, not with that face. The witch held the broom up at an angle. Tell me the truth, and when you've finished, then I'll kill you. For in times like these, my little one, you must kill before you are killed. I couldn't kill you, said the girl weeping. I was horror-struck to have killed your sister. How could I kill you, too? Very charming, said the witch. Very nice, very touching. Then why did you come here? Yes, the wizard said to murder you, Dorothy said, but I never intended to. Not why I came. The witch held the burning broom even higher, closer to look at the girl's face. When they said when they said that it was your sister and I that we had to come here, it was like a prison sentence and I never wanted to. But I thought, well, I would come, and my friends would come with me to help, and I would come and I would say, Say what? cried the witch on the edge. I would say to the girl straightening up, gritting her teeth, I would say to you, would you ever forgive me for that accident, for the death of your sister? Would you ever, ever forgive me, for I could never forgive myself? The witch shrieked in panic and disbelief that even now the world should twist so, offending her once again. Elphaba, who had endured Serena's refusal to forgive, now begged by a gibbering child for the same mercy always denied her. How could you give such a thing out of your own hollowness? She was caught, twisting, trying, full of will, but toward what? A fragment of the brush of the broom fluttered off and lit on her skirt, and there was a run of flames in her lap, eating at the driest tinder of the vincus. Oh, will this nightmare never end, screamed Dorothy, as she grabbed at a bucket of collecting rainwater that in the sudden flare-up of light had come into view. She said, I will save you, and she hurled the water at the witch. An instant of sharp pain before the numbness. The world was floods above and fire below. If there was such a thing as a soul, the soul had gambled on a sort of baptism, and it had won. The body apologizes to the soul for its error, and the soul asks forgiveness for squatting in the body without invitation. A ring of expectant faces before the light dims. They move in like shadows, like ghouls. There is Mama playing with her hair. There is Nessa Rose, stern and bleached as a weathered timber. There is Papa, lost in his reflection, looking for himself in the faces of the suspicious heathen. There is Shell, not quite yet himself, despite his apparent wholeness. They become others. They become Nanny. In her prime, tart and officious, and Amma Clutch, and Amma Vimp, and other Ammas lumped together now in the maternal blur. They become Bach, sweet and lithe and earnest, as yet unbound, and crope and tibbet in their funny, campy anxiety to be liked, and Averick in his superiority, and Glinda in her gowns, waiting to be good enough to deserve what she gets. And the ones whose stories are over, Manic and Madame Morrible and Dr. Dilliman and most of them Fiero, whose blue diamonds are the blues of water and the sulfurous fire of both. And the one whose stories are curiously unfinished. Was it to be like this? The Princess Nastasho Toya of the Scrow, whose help could not arrive in time, and Lear, the mysterious foundling boy, pushing out his pea pod. Sarima, who in her loving welcome is sisterless, 
Linus would not forgive, and Serena's sister, and children, and future, and past, and the ones who fell to the wizard, including Killjoy, and the other resident creatures behind them, the wizard himself, a failure until he exiled himself from his own land, and behind him, Yackle, whoever she was, if anyone, and the anonymous adepts, if they existed, and the dwarf who had no name to share. The creatures of makeshift lives, the hobbled together, the disenfranchised, and the abused, the lion, the scarecrow, the maimed wood, tin woodman, up from the shattered for an instant, up until the light, then back. The goddess of gifts, the last, reaching in among flames and water, cradling her, crooning something, but the words remain unclear. And that is the end of the Wicked Witch of the West in Wicked. <laughs>